You're tuned in and locked on. Gay News Radio with Brandon Carmody. Only on the GNR Radio Network. You're listening to Gay News Radio. I'm Brandon Carmody. Our guest today is Brandon Wallace. Welcome to GNR. Thank you, Brandon. Appreciate it. So, I understand that you worked for several years as a Southern Baptist youth minister in Arkansas, but then you ultimately left the position in 2012. Could you tell us if being gay was a part of your decision to leave the ministry, and how was being gay a factor? It was definitely a big factor. It wasn't the, I mean, it wasn't the all, that wasn't the total reason I left, but it was the main reason I left. Um, You know, being gay and being Southern Baptist are, mutually exclusive. Um, and for many years, I thought that being gay and being Christian was mutually exclusive. But then, you know, just to, through the course of my studying, um, you know, I was in the closet the whole time, but just studying and reading and doing as much exegesis as I could, um, I finally realized that I could be a Christian and be out as a gay man, but I couldn't do that in the realm of the Southern Baptist world. So that's why I had to step out. Um, you know, it was a big decision for me. I I lost so many people that just, you know, two days prior to my coming out, um, con- you know, considered friends, um, you know, and it, just the moment they learned that one thing, they, they just withdrew. They, they had wanted nothing to do with it. Um, you know, and that that could definitely leave a bitter taste in your mouth. But luckily, like I said, I, I learned that there's there's Christianity outside of the Southern Baptist world. And so I found a, you know, a home in that style of Christianity. Right, no, totally. So how difficult was it for you to reconcile your feelings and attractions with what you were taught about Scripture, and how did you come to terms with both? Well, that's the that's the million-dollar question there. Um, you know, and it definitely didn't happen overnight. Um, I I knew two things when I was about seven years old. I knew that I was supposed to be in the ministry and that, you know, I, I had a very strong faith. And the second thing was that I was attracted to the same sex. And that's tough to to work around when you grow up in, you know, Bible Belt, Arkansas, where being gay is quote unquote an abomination. Like there's you like I said earlier, you, you in that in that world you can't be gay and Christian at the same time. It's like you gotta pick one or the other. And so for many years I I did what I call the game. I called him straight face. It was just this mask I wore. You know, and just hid those feelings down deep into nobody. Nobody. Uh, I didn't tell my best friend. I didn't tell a soul. Um, you know about my feelings and attractions wow. um, until I was 23 years old. You know, I kept that bottled up. I did all of my studying, all of my research, completely anonymously in my dorm room or in my apartment. You know, on my computer and at books at night. I would, I would go to work in the ministry during the day, I'd do my ministry things in the afternoon, spend time with my friends. And then go home and research. It just became such a part of my life uh, because I think there was a part of me inside that knew deep down that if God truly loved me, He would love me in spite. You know, not I don't want to say in spite, but He wouldn't care about these feelings that I can't control. You know what I mean? Um, if God truly was this God of love that I was told He was, I think something inside me knew that there had to be a bigger picture than the lines that I was being fed, and so. So how difficult was it? It was probably the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life was reconciling those two things. But once I was on the other side of it and I came to terms with my feelings and attractions and with Scripture, um, it was the most beautiful spot in life I've ever been. Oh, that's great to hear. Um, I'm a a gay Christian as well, just to share that with you and with our listeners. No, I think uh, I think more gay Christians should speak up. I mean, there's there's this uh, oh, yeah. there's this stigma that still even even here in 2016 where we've got gay priests and and gay bishops, there's still this stigma that um, if you're gay, you can't really be Christian, or if you're Christian, you can't really be gay. And that's not just in the Christian world. I see it in the gay world. You know, so many gay people think that okay, I'm out now, I can't have a Christian life, or I can't go to a Christian church. You know, and, and you know, that's that's kind of my mission is I want – I don't really want to go to the Christians and change their mind. I want to go to the gay people and say, hey, look, not all Christians are what you know as Christianity. Not all Christians hate gay people. Not all Christians say you can't have a partner 
and still be a follower of Christ. That that's just one branch of the followers, you know. Um, I, I think people like you and I need to speak out more often that we are out gay Christians. I was thinking about doing a program on it for sure. Now, I noticed there's a lot of online resources, by the way, like if you're going to be clergy or if you're going to become a minister. So one of them, these next few questions will be based on it, Brandon, is the ChristianBibleReference.org. So it's sort of the, what should my views on homosexuality be if I'm going to be in the clergy? So here, I'm going to ask you some of the questions based on that. Should okay. a Christian oppose same-sex marriage and partnerships? So how would you approach that? Should you as clergy or minister, oppose same-sex relationships and partnerships? Well, you know, clergy is a big umbrella term. You know, if I were speaking to a Southern Baptist who wanted to be a clergyman, um, then, yeah, they're probably going to say, yes, you have to oppose it. But if I was speaking to an Episcopal priest, they would say, no, we ordain or we bless same-sex marriages every day. You know, Uh, personally, I think that uh, marriage is a – is a, is a one of the Christian rights, and I think um, yes, it definitely can be held between two people of the same sex. So, some Christians are apparently strongly opposed to legalizing what they view as sinful behavior and a perversion of God. And of course, we can get into the literature: your Genesis two twenty four, Leviticus twenty thirteen, et cetera, et cetera. But other Christians view equal civil rights for gays and lesbians to marry as a requirement of Bible teachings that we must act with kindness and respect for all people to avoid judging the moral choices of others. So where where do you land on that side of the coin? Yeah, um, well, I mean, I definitely take the more progressive side because everybody throws these verses out. We there there are seven verses in Scripture that refer to homosexuality. That's it, seven. Um, we call them the the. The clobber verses. I, I on my blog, thegaychristian.com, um, I cover each one of those verses individually, and it was a big part of my own research when I was trying to come to terms with my sexuality and my faith. Um, what I started to find when I got to the heart of all seven of those clobber verses is that in no way were they referring to monogamous same-sex relationships as we know them today. And what I mean by that is when Moses was writing, you know, the first five books of the Bible, or when Paul was writing the letter to the Corinthians or the letter to the Romans, there was no concept of a marriage between the same sex because in those days, marriage, it, it wasn't necessarily about love. Marriage was about, you know, it was, it was most of the time it was arranged. It was a business contract, basically. Um, and then even in, in the Roman times, they had marriage. But most of the men also had male lovers that they had on the side or, you know, different uh, things. There was there was no concept of a same-sex marriage, so there was no way to speak into that. But what I did find out is that anything that was um, – any, any of the scriptures that, were, that seemed to say um, two men shouldn't lie together or, or two women shouldn't lie together, which there's only one reference to, to lesbian because the rest are two men um, – any reference to that was there, – there seemed to be a power struggle. It was either um, male prostitution outside of a temple for temple worship, or it referred to some sort of rape or, um, or you know, pederasty or something like that. There was no right. – there, 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 there's absolutely no condemnation of two men loving one another or two women loving one another. And so you know, when we fight about these verses, I think it's very – it's very important to get to the heart of what these verses are saying and, and and put them in context. You know, it's easy to just pull them out, but when we put them in context, get to the history behind it, we see that there is no condemnation of same-sex couples marrying one another. And, and going back to what I said at the beginning, the reason for that is because 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago, it just wasn't a concept because marriage itself has transformed over the last, you know, 3,000 years. It's not what it used to be. And I think it's also exactly. C.S. Lewis. Says, C.S. Lewis talks about marriage, and he says he, he he writes to the Christians, and he says that we've got to see marriage in two lights. There is church marriage, and then there is civil marriage. And he even said, you know, C.S. Lewis is one of the greatest Christian writers of our time. He even said the church has no right stepping into social marriage because that has to do with the state. Christian marriage is a totally different thing. And so, if your church 
doesn't want to marry gay people, you don't have to. But you can't stop the social side of the aspect of that marriage. So, you know, even when we when the Supreme Court decided that um, we can no longer ban gay marriage, it's not saying that every Southern Baptist church has to host a gay marriage. That's their that, that, that's their choice. They don't have to do that. But it also needs to be known that there are many, many churches out there that fully support it, and many, many more are opening up to support it every day. Right. So it sounds like there's no precedent for same-sex marriage or partnerships, but there's no specific prohibition is kind of what I'm reading. Exactly. Now, on the next, exactly. on the next question, by the way, um, uh, here's the imagery that I draw to mind on this question number four. Um, I'm picturing my Republican father as if he was a guest on the Rachel Maddow show, and he had right. no foreknowledge whatsoever what the questions were, almost like he was in a booth, you know, soundproof booth, and the audience was shh, shh, and then Rachel Maddow opens the door, my father steps out and then asks this question, what does the Bible say about gay and lesbian sex? So the question <laughs> in this case, though, does go to you, Brandon, not my Republican father. What does the Bible say about gay and lesbian sex? Um, well, I kind of hit on this in the last question. The Bible says absolutely nothing on gay and lesbian sex when it is in the context of a monogamous, rela loving relationship. The only time the Bible talks about any sex that is related to gay and lesbian, and I will point out that it also points out straight sex in most of those verses, is when it refers to rape or prostitution, most of the time male prostitution outside of temple worship, and Pederasty. That's the only times it talks about it. Um, even, even, you know, so even, let's go to Leviticus verses. Le, the verses in Leviticus. It says, uh, man shall not lie with another man as with a woman. This is an abomination. Um, a lot of scholars believe that what they're referring to there, you know, Moses was leading the Jewish people away out of captivity in Egypt. And the language he uses there seems to refer back, when you get to the original Hebrew and everything, it seems to refer back to something that happened in Egypt. When Egypt would win a battle, the men would take the other men on the losing side to the battlefield and rape them anally. Oh, my God. And, right? Yeah. Oh, my God. Literally. Do. Yeah, <laughs> literally. That's, wow. And that was, it was a sign of domination. We won. You are less than man now. You are... It's basically saying, I'm putting you in the role of a woman. You are submissive now. And so the language is the Bible? Comes back to that. No, that's just from history. Um, but what okay. I'm saying is when you, <laughs> when you link those verses to the context of what, what Moses was writing about, he's saying, and, and the word abomination when translated literally to today's English, it, it literally means we don't do that. And so Moses is pointing back to this style of, of a way of life. This is what the Egyptians did. Now we as Jewish people are coming away from that. Now look back to what they did. They dominated one another using sex as a, as a force of domination. That's an abomination. We don't do that. And you move in, okay, let's, let's talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, one of, the most, one of the most used Bible verses against same-sex uh, marriage or same-sex sex. That, that story has nothing to do with same-sex monogamous relationships. Two angels came to visit, and the men of the town wanted to rape the two men. And right. Lot comes out and says, no, no, no. What does Lot say in return? Hey, take my two virgin daughters and rape them instead. You don't see people pointing to those verses because that takes away from the context of the story. That story is about hospitality. That's what it's about. It even says that. There are seven other verses in the Bible that specifically say these are the sins of Sodom. Jesus says one of those seven verses himself, and all seven of those verses, they don't say the sins of Sodom was homosexual sex. The sins of Sodom was not taking care of the poor and the foreigners. It's not showing hospitality. It's not being a good person to people that come to visit, to those that are from the outside. That's what the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is about. Now, let's move into the New Testament. You've got Romans, and you've got 1 Corinthians. In Romans, it, again, you can't just read that first chapter of Romans and say, oh, well, Paul's against same-sex marriage. No, put it in the context of Romans 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, and you see that Paul is talking 
to Jewish people. This this kind of parallels the the Moses Egyptian story when you move in there because Paul is writing to the Jewish people in Rome. Rome had a practice. They worshipped this one goddess. I can't remember her name. I have to look. It's on my blog um, when you go to the Club Reverses about the Romans passage. Um, but they had they they worshipped this goddess, and one of the ways they worshipped her was by going into a room. Men went into one room. Women went into another room. And they had a wild orgy. That was their worship. Right. And a lot of times, other men would stand outside the door and be prostitutes for the orgy worship. So if I wanted to go worship this goddess, I'd take 20 bucks. I'd go to the temple. I'd find a male prostitute. Here's 20 bucks. Let's go in. Let's take part, and I can do my worship deed. Okay? Paul is writing to these, these Jewish now Christians, these Jewish Christians in Rome, and he's saying, hey, guys, we don't do that because that's idol worship. We don't want to take part in a pagan practice. That's not what we do. Again, has absolutely nothing to do with monogamous, same-sex, loving relationships. This is all about prostitution, idol worship, and domination. Right. Every scripture verse in the Bible. So really, the Bible is silent about gay and lesbian sex when it relates to monogamous, loving relationships. Well, except for this one right here. By the way, I strongly do not agree with this, but here I'll read. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Leviticus 20, 13. Yeah, that's the Leviticus. That's, 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 that's the one sounds, a, that sounds a little judgmental. That, that sounds pretty so, well, pretty uh, death, death-defying. <laughs> well, those those are the verses. Leviticus eighteen twenty two and Leviticus twenty thirteen. Those are the two verses I was talking about when I said that Moses was making a comparison to the Egyptians. When you get to the original language of those verses and you put it in context with the other, the other verses around it, it seems to be that that's what Moses is talking about. He's pointing back to the way the Egyptian soldiers dominated their whoever they, they defeated in battle, and that's what he's talking about right there. He's saying, hey, yeah. don't rape another man. <laughs> you know, That's right, what right. it boils down to. Not, it's an again, abomination. Not in the context, we don't do that. Loving, loving, committed relationships, right? Again, exactly, uh, exactly. And, you know, and that makes a great sound bit for a GOP candidate or you know an anti-gay preacher. Hey, this is one verse. It says it right here. Easy. It's it's black and white. You know, here we go. End all. No, you put that Fox in context. <laughs> you you do yeah. You do your history lesson. You do some research. You see that has nothing to do with monogamous loving relationships. So then, what does the Bible say about gay and lesbian people? I mean, does it say that sexual orientation is not a sin? Does it say it is? So what does it say about the people? Silent about it. You know what I think the Bible says about gay and lesbian people? It boils down to this. Uh, Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those that are in Jesus Christ. John three, uh, John chapter 3 specifically says, God is love. Um, God loves his people, all people. Paul wrote that in Christ there's no longer slave nor free, no longer Jew nor Greek, no longer male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. I don't believe God sees a gay and lesbian person any different than he sees a straight person, and he has nothing but love for every one of his children, no matter gay, straight, trans, bisexual, uh, you know, you go across the spectrum. It doesn't matter. The end all, what the Bible ultimately says about God is that God loves every single human being, whether we like it or not. We've spent the last 2,000 years trying to label who's in and who's out, but from the very beginning, and I believe Scripture is plain as day on this, from the very beginning, God has been saying, you're all in. Whether you like it or not, you're in. God loves you, period. So let's talk about pastors and clergy for a moment. So 11, 12 years ago, whatever it was, uh, for a brief time we had gay marriage here in Oregon. I took part in a rush to the altar. Didn't quite work out, but long story short, I got married by a gay pastor. So the question right. is, <laughs> what, does the, what, is, what does the Bible say about gay and lesbian pastors, ministers, or priests? Will these homosexuals go to heaven? Um, I think – well, I hope homosexuals go to heaven because I'm planning on it. Um. <laughs> And you know, I'm I'm working towards being a gay priest myself. Um, I don't think the I, I'm not even gonna say think. I know the Bible doesn't say anything about sexuality when it refers to pastors, ministers, and priests, other than they should be committed to their partner. That's it. Um, you know, I think God's gonna hold the the gay and lesbian pastors, ministers, and priests to the same 
level that he holds the straight ones. It's, you know, how well did you do the work of the church? Um, you know, are, are you are you staying sober of mind? Are you leading the people? Or are you taking them astray? You know, I don't think <clears throat> I don't think sexuality has anything to do with it. Um, now, does it have anything to do with it when you break down denominations? Sure. You know, you're you're it, we're if we ever see a Southern Baptist or a Church of Christ gay minister, we're probably at least 25, 30 years from that, if ever. Um, okay. You know, so when you get into the denominations, yeah, they're going to have some some pretty hardcore stringent. There's going to be a lot of no's said there. Um, but, you know, you get into uh, Lutherans and Episcopalians and Presbyterians and, and some other branches, Disciples of Christ. Um, they're already opening the doors for gay pastors and lesbian pastors and ministers and priests and deacons and um, you know, anybody across the board. So what does the Bible say about it? I, again, the Bible's silent about a person's sexuality when they're in the pastorate, um, other than they should be committed to their partner. And that's really what it boils down to. Um, be an example of what love looks like by loving your partner. Right. And the question seems to be whether homosexuality should disqualify a person from ministry while other sins like thoughts, greed, deceit, envy, arrogance, folly, etc., do not disqualify a person. So there's obviously different opinions, but like you're oh, saying, yeah. it really depends on the, each each individual denomination and how hardcore they are on right. whether or not to right. allow us to be out. And that's what sucks is because, you know, a lot of hurt has been done by the church in the name of God when God had nothing to do with it. You know, I had a big struggle when I, because when I, when I left the ministry, um, I, I didn't come out. I was outed. Um, and it was two days after I left the church. I was planning on coming out, but I wasn't planning on doing that quick. Um, it blew up. You know, like I said, two days prior, these people literally had a celebration calling me the the best youth minister to cross their the paths. They were thanking me for the years of service and all the stuff that was done. Two days later, just finding out this one piece of information, hey, Brandon has homosexual feelings. Suddenly, I was Lucifer incarnate. People were – my phone blew up. I had, to, I had to change my phone number because I was getting so many messages by the hundreds every hour um, telling me they wish I had never come there. Some saying I wish I'd never been born. I got death threats, um, got threats saying if they ever see me out in the streets, it's not going to be pretty for me. Ended up having to move to a new, new city that night. Um, somebody came and got me, packed wow. up my bags, and I was gone that night. Um, <clears throat> it got ugly quick. And so I struggled for a while, a good seven, eight months of – you know, am I done with the church completely? Because, um, you know, why would I want to go back to that? And for a while, I didn't. Until it hit me, I was like, you know what, Brandon? That's not fair to God. Because God didn't hurt me. People hurt me in his name. And I can't project that back onto God himself. And when I came back to God with that in mind, everything was different. And... And that's that's what I want a lot of other gay people who still have the faith to know is that I know you've been hurt. I've been on that. I've felt that pain. I've felt that disownership or, you know, I've, I've felt that disowning. I, I know the emptiness and how harsh that is. But you've got to remember God didn't do that. People did that. And they've been doing this for hundreds of years. It hasn't just been about homosexuality. Uh, I'm going back to your question here. I'm, this is a big segue. Um, but, you know, you you said, should homosexuality disqualify a person when other sins don't? That's because we as a culture have set up homosexuality as this end-all thing. And the Bible had nothing to do with that. That's people's biases and prejudices working their way into theology, and much in the same way as it did with the African-American debate 150 years ago. You know, or much in the yeah. same way as it did as the women debate 80 years ago. The culture so many times shapes the way we do theology, the way we read scripture, that it hurts so many people. And that's why it's so important that we, if we are going to call ourselves followers of Christ, we do the hard work. We research. We get down there and figure out what's being said. Because when you start throwing these verses around, people get hurt. There, I mean, how many people have committed suicide because of these verses? How many people have been beaten because of these verses? If you don't do the hard work yourself, if you can't tell me the context of the verse that you're quoting to me, why are you spouting it off in hatred? 
because I think I think in the end that's going to be the harshest judgment. And I don't think God's going to say, "Hey, who'd you sleep with?" I think God's going to say, "Hey, what'd you do with the stuff that I gave you? I gave you these verses. I gave you the tools to make it happen. I only asked one thing of you: go and love people as you love yourself." Well, how well did you do that? And how well did you do that with the scripture that you were throwing around? So, yes, obviously different opinions. Um, do I believe homosexuals go to heaven? Absolutely. Um, do I think people that think homosexuality is a sin will go to heaven? Absolutely. And I think when we get up to the gates, we're going to be really surprised to see each other there. All right. Well, so getting, getting a little personal here, so how would you define your Christianity? It seems like you've evolved, but now that you step back from the formality, do you feel that you're being uh, your authentic self as both a gay man and a Christian, or are those two concepts that are eternally at odds with each other? Oh, no. The moment I took off straight face, um, and it's detailed more in, in my book, it's called Straight Face, and I kind of take you to the whole process of what it's like to grow up in the evangelical church as a gay person, you know, and dealing with these two conflicting feelings. Um, you know, it's it's very detailed. But to give you the, the summative version, um, the moment I took that mask off was the first time I ever think I had a true relationship with God. Because up until that point, I was trying to relate to God through a persona. It wasn't me. My big moment was when I was fighting it out with God trying to work so hard to make God love me in spite of these feelings that I had, that I had no control over. And it's when God finally told me, Brandon, I love all of my creation. But you know what? Straight face, that's your creation. That's not mine. I don't love straight face. I love who I made, and who I made is you. And that was my big moment. And and just you could just feel, you know, my reconvening with God and just and just coming back and um yes, my faith has evolved so much since I left um evangelical Christianity, but it's so much better. Um I I feel you know, I, and I think it boils down to this that the one thing God truly wants for us is to be in community. You know, that's the last thing Jesus asked before he left this earth. He prayed, God, if there's one thing I pray for my church, it's to be unified. He wants community for us. Well, the only way that we can have true community is to be authentic. I can't have community with you, Brandon, if I if I don't know you or if every time I see you I put up a front and I make this persona and, and you don't know who I am inside as a real person. If you don't know that, well, we can't have community together. And so I think that's why this is so important to God. I think it's really important to God that we do come out. God wants us to be authentic with one another, and that starts by taking off our masks. And I'm not just talking about homosexuality at this point. Because we all have masks. We're all hiding something ne that we perceive as negative about ourselves that we don't want our community to know. But God is ultimately calling all of us to take off those masks, step out, be authentic, and in that authenticity, in that community, you will find that you finally have connected with the love that is God and it's going to change your life. All right. Now, let me, there's two, two bonus questions for you, kind of a lightning round, <laughs> as it were. So, question All right. number one, just looking at current context, United States of America. So, obviously, June 2015, the Supreme Court handed down landmark legislation, Obergefell v. Hodges. Uh, we actually have Jim Obergefell coming back to talk to us in June to uh, give us his one-year recap. Of, but, obviously, it allowed for same-sex marriage across the nation, you also have a supporting president of the United States and uh, other key members of government. But then you have an election year where we have several Republican candidates that have literally announced intentions to do terrible things like attack the Supreme Court, you know, put uh, Supreme Court judges in that would undo it or pass state legislation. So I just wanted to get your gut reaction to the Christianity that you see uh, prophesied from the Republican candidates in the current election? Like, uh, do you support it? Or are you disgusted by it? What, what's your take on this election madness that we've all been uh, seeing play out like a reality show? I think any sane person would be disgusted by it. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. It's not my not my brain. You know, I tell people all the time, you know, cause Christian, the, the having the label Christian is almost a loaded word because 
sometimes I hate to tell people I'm a Christian because they they come when they hear that they have these preconceived notions that I'm like one of those guys and I and I tell people all the time, hey, the God that that you don't believe in that these um, <laughs> fundamentalists are are espousing, yeah, I don't believe in that God either. So we're on the same page. Um, and I feel like for a lot of these candidates, though, it's just a soundbite. I'm really not that concerned about it. Now, just for safety's sake, I would prefer one of them not get in the presidency just in case. But I think for most of these guys, it's a soundbite to try to win votes because they know that the Supreme Court has already spoken and the president is not going to trump the Supreme Court. They're just trying to win that you know, fundamentalist evangelical vote. I think that's what it all boils down to. Okay, very good. And then so just taking that same context in America where we are today where um, much more than 50 percent, you know, support gay rights or for us to be out. So is there a space in this current country and in this environment for out gay Christians or for people to come to that light or come out? Oh, totally. Once I started looking for gay affirming churches, they were everywhere. Um, had no idea, you know, because, you know, in, in the evangelical world, we kind of live in our own little bubble, and we forget that there's a whole other world out there. Um, once I looked for gay affirming churches, it was so easy to find one. Like I said, the Episcopal Church opened its doors to me. I fell in love with it instantly, but there are other ones, Disciples of Christ, um, uh, Lutherans, Presbyterians, and, and, a, and a branch of, you know, a whole host of non-denominational churches. Uh, I even found that there are some Roman Catholic churches that are open and affirming, which blew me away. Um you know, there are websites like uh, you can go to Google and uh, I think it's called GayChurch.com or GayChurch.org, um, and they'll tell you all the local churches in your area that support you as a person to be authentic and be an out gay person and be a follower of Christ. Um, plenty of resources out there. And I would I would urge any listener who, you know, has been burned by the church um, or grew up fundamentalist or evangelical and wants nothing to do with that again, I'm telling you from experience, my time – in one of these open and affirming churches has been a breath of fresh air because it is nothing like what life was like for me in the evangelical church. It's safe. It's life giving. Um, and it's just like a drink of cool water in the middle of the desert. It's, uh, I would urge you to at least give it a shot. Definitely. Uh, thank you, Renan. And um, give you a chance here to uh, do some plug Rama. Where, where can the listeners find you online and what's the book? Um, okay, I have a presence. It's thegaychristian.com. Not gaychristian.com, but thegaychristian.com. Um, that's where I keep up with just current events. I haven't been really active last few months just because I've been kind of taking a little sabbatical, but I'm getting back into the writing. Um, you can kind of keep up with things there. Also find a host of resources for if you have questions or if you have family members have questions. Um, I, I'm finding that my blog has been less for gay people and more for People are people around the gay people that are coming out, you know, parents and children and brothers and sisters that are just trying to figure it out. Um, so definitely some resources there. Uh, the book is called Straight Face. Um, you can find that on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or just about any of the uh, the main main places to find books. Um, and again, it just it chronicles kind of it kind of gives you an insight on what it's like to grow up gay in the evangelical world and and how I came to terms with that. Um, and again, I'm finding that the people that are getting the most out of that book isn't really even the gay people. It's uh, it's the people around them. So many parents have bought this book, uh, and they said it really helped them kind of get a better understanding of what their kid went through and, you know, and brothers and sisters and people around the people that came out. So give it a shot. Yeah, no, great. Thank you so much for coming on today. It's uh, great to speak with another gay Christian. It's a breath of fresh air. Thank you, Brendan. Definitely, Brendan. Anytime. You just let me know. Okay, thanks for coming on, GR. Have a good day. (laughs) Thank you, you too. You've been listening to Gay News Radio on the GNR Radio Network. Download our mobile app for iPhone and Android today. And have a good gay.